اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم ربی شرح لی صدری و یسر لی امری و اہل العقدت من لسان یفکہ قولی الحمدللہ رب العالمین ثم الصلاة والسلام على سیدنا و نبینا و حبیب الہ العالمین ابی القاسم محمد اللہم صلی اللہ علیہ محمد و آل محمد و علی آلہ الطیبین الطاہرین المعصومین اما بعد فقد قال اللہ تعالی فی کتابہ مجید بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم وَيَعِدُكُمْ أَنَّكُمْ إِذَا مِتْتُمْ وَكُنْتُمْ تُرَابًا وَعِذَامًا أَنَّكُمْ مُخْرَجُونَ آمَنَّا بِاللَّهِ صَدَقَ اللَّهُ الْعَلِيُّ الْعَظِيمُ اللہم صلی اللہ علیہ محمد و آل محمد Respected elders, brothers and sisters, السلام علیکم ورحمت اللہ وبرکاتہ Welcome to our discussion around the 18th section of the Holy Quran uh, inshallah, today's discor- discourse and discussion around the 18th section will be brief so that we can uh, address the importance of the upcoming nights and address the shahadat of our master, Amir al muminin Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. Uh, in the 18th section, there are three surahs that are discussed in here. Surah Al-Mu'minun, which is the 23rd surah of the Holy Quran. Surah Al-Nur, the 24th surah. And Surah Al-Furqan is started but not completed, the 25th surah of the Holy Quran. We've selected a few verses from each of these surah to discuss. However, again, obviously we're not discussing all of the important verses. There are many, many important verses. They're all important verses. But briefly, to get a flavor of some of the points that Allah discusses, we address them here. The first one that I wanted to talk to you about was verse number 35, which extends into 36, 37. Verse number 35 uh, it's saying, أَيَعِدُكُمْ أَنَّكُمْ إِذَا مِتُّمْ وَكُنْتُمْ تُرَابٌ وَعِذَامًا أَنَّكُمْ مُخْرِجُونَ So if you have your Qur'an to look on with, verse number 35 talks about a statement of the polytheists and those who refuse to believe in Islam, who said about the Holy Prophet, they said, Does he promise you that when you have died, أَيَعِدُكُمْ أَنَّكُمْ إِذَا مِتُّمْ Does he promise you that when you have died, وَكُنْتُمْ تَرَابًا وَعِذَامًا That when you are dust and bones, أَنَّكُمْ مُخْرَجُونَ That you will indeed be raised again. So they're, they're, they're making a claim to kind of ridicule and deride the religion of the Holy Prophet, that they're making the statement that, is this man promising you that you'll be raised again? That there will be something after this life? Hi-hat, hi-hat, lima tu adun. Far-fetched, far-fetched. Is that what you are promising? So they're saying, how ridiculous this promise that you're making, O, o, o one who claims to be the Prophet. Inna hiya illa hayatuna dunya namutu wa nahya wa ma nahnu bi mab'uthin. Then they conclude, there is nothing but the life of this world. We live and we die, and we shall not be resurrected. This was the claim of the disbelievers at that time, that they questioned the idea of how is it possible for us to die and then be resurrected. So this is foolishness and nonsense. As a matter of fact, this wasn't the first time this had been claimed, that there's nothing after this life and that this is the only life that we live in and there's nothing beyond it and that nothing else matters except for this life and anyone who promises you otherwise is a liar. As a matter of fact, we have narrations from Ayyam alayhim salam that there came a nation who sincerely when a prophet of Allah came to them and would tell them that after this life they will be rewarded or they will be punished. They sincerely pondered over this point that really after this life we're going to be rewarded, we're going to be punished. And they came back to the Prophet and they said, listen, with all due respect, and they didn't intend to ridicule the Prophet at that time, but they they asked that Holy Prophet and they said, are you sure you're telling the truth? We've never seen anything like this. All we've seen is what exists in this world. And you're telling us that the reward that will come will be far greater than anything we've imagined in this world. And you're telling us the punishment that will come will be far worse than anything we've imagined in this world. But really, all we know is the existence of this life. How do we know you're telling us the truth? And the Imam explained that that Holy Prophet went and he asked Allah, he said, how do I answer them about this question that they're asking me? 
And in reply to this query of the people, since they were sincere and really wanted to know, Allah granted humanity the ability to have dreams. And we know in our dreams, and, and dreams is an entire different discussion altogether, but in our dreams we can see things that don't exist in reality. We can see things or things are presented to us that if our self is pure, we can experience, experience events of heaven. And if we're impure or that Allah chooses to show us a warning, sometimes we can see even events of painful chastisement and difficulty that we go through in our dreams that don't exist in this world. And in this way, Allah answered the question of the people of that time that, Yes, something else does exist, though you may not have seen it in this world. Allah has many realms that He controls, and from amongst them will be the world of heaven, or the the entire realm of heaven, not even world, and the realm of hell. But these people who derided the Prophet, their their intellectual capacity was obviously limited. That they were complaining that does He promise you that you will be brought back to life after this? No, it's only this life, and that in this life you live and you die, and there's nothing to be resurrected about. There's many intellectual proofs that we should think about when we think about the concept of death and life and coming back to life again, including the fact the justice of Allah. And the justice of Allah is one of the, one of the things that gives us confidence that there has to be some place of reward and punishment after this. And the example that's very famously given is, is that if you save a life, you should be then rewarded for saving that life. But no matter if you save one person or a thousand person people, your life doesn't get any longer. And the same way, for example, whether I kill one person or kill a million people, Na'uzubillah, may nobody be killed. But you can only be punished once for it. We would say there's no justice in this. There's no real benefit for saving lives because, well, it doesn't extend my life. I don't see a benefit to this action in my life. My life is still going to be 80 years or 70 years or 60 years. It's not going to change that, oh, you know, when your time for death comes, oh, you save... 500 people, so let's add on 500 years for you. There you go, have have those 500 years. Even if we were to say that you do get a, hundred, a year for every life that you save. First off, that's arbitrary. Why only a year? Why not more? But what would be the quality of those years? It's not like, for example, if I saved somebody at 37, well, I get another year at the age of 37, and therefore, or I save somebody at 40, so I live another year at the age of 40. No. We would say that if anything, those years would be added on to the end of your life and the quality of your life at that point in time might not be that great to begin with anyway. The same way with punishment. There are evil personalities who have passed in history that have been responsible for the deaths of millions of people. Yet they themselves were laid in a grave once. That alone is proof to us to tell us that something has to exist after this life where reward and punishment will be given to those who did good or evil and that this is one of the intellectual authorities that there has to be something further to that there's the conversation that explains to us for example that uh, it's not difficult for Allah to bring back something to life we would say it's difficult to create but to recreate should be simple and easy because Allah has created it once yet the argument is is that if we were created once how can we be created again and Allah presents in many different places Proofs of this, for example, even when he says, do you not see the earth that it was dried and empty and there was nothing on it and then we sent upon it rain and then it came back to life? Don't you think now? Aren't you not thoughtful about this? That something was dead in front of you and it came back to life by our command that we sent rain and it came back to life. The same way Allah is saying that I have the ability to bring you back to life. So it's an important discussion for us to understand. The second verse that we want to take a look at is in Surah An-Nur. Surah An-Nur is one of the surahs that is very highly recommended to teach our daughters and our sisters and to make sure that the women of our families and our communities read it frequently. It is a surah that is said by which the chastity of women is protected. Uh, in it are many discussions around chastity of women and protection of their purity. And it's something that every mu'min, by the advice of the Ahlul Bayt, should ensure that they're daughters that their women read frequently so that it ensures their protection from from harm and from this any harm that could come to the sanctity of their purity so it's a very good surah especially for our daughters that we make it a point that we focus on this and that we introduce it to them and that we make it a practice of regular recitation so as we use divine protection as well as intellectual protection as well as our own oversight to ensure that they are protected in difficult times and difficult places 
Now there are many verses in Surah An-Nur. Surah An-Nur by itself takes its name from the 35th surah of this 35th ayat of this surah and where Allah discusses uh Allahu nuru samawati wal ard and gives the example of his light and and it's an important verse for us to know. The verse I wanted to focus on today very briefly was verse number 26. Al khabi al khabithatu lil khabithina wal Ulaika mubarra'un mubarra'una mimma yaqulun lahum maghfiratun wa rizqun karim This verse it talks about that for vicious or khabith impure women are impure men or vicious men and for vicious men are vicious women and for good pious pure women are good pious pure men and that for good pious pure men are good pious pure women and they are absolved of what they say about them, meaning that the good people who may be treated by slander, they are absolved of that slander, that they won't be, that that's not true of them. And for them is forgiveness and noble provision, that the good people will be given good provision, a good place, and that they will not be affected by the negative words that are said about them or evil that is said about them. This verse teaches us of an important oath and commitment and possibly a hukum of Allah, that we should be careful of who we marry our children to or who we marry ourselves and our family into. We should look at their character and we should make sure that for the pure people are pure spouses and for the evil people are evil spouses. Are those who commit indecency or those who are associated with filth, they should not be married into good families, into pure families, pious families. Sometimes when we make decisions, especially in our youth, we don't think about the long-term consequence. We don't think about who or how this will affect my marriage or how this will affect my children or how this will affect my life. But here Allah is making a commitment. You have the freedom to make any decision that you want. You have the freedom to live your life the way you want to because Allah has given you this life as a place of testing. But if you indulge in filth, then that will be what you are returned. And if you indulge in goodness, then that will be your return. It's impossible to imagine that we should do all of the evil we want and do all of the bad things that we can, indulge in all of the evil and frivolous actions that exist and still be entitled to goodness. That would be unjust according to Allah. That would be unfair. And we know that Allah is just and adil. When we make decisions about our character, we need to think about long term, who am I, who do I want to be, what do I want to be like, and how do these decisions impact me? And that's very important to understand that they do impact me, and my future does change based upon the decisions that I make. And we need to talk to our children, and we need to protect our children from this culture of indecency that exists around us. And these are verses that we use to give solace and to talk to our children. Now listen, if you maintain a good character, if you avoid the evils of this place, Allah will give you goodness. And Allah will promise His goodness for the good ones. And that's our job is that we, when we protect our piety, we ask Allah for help and we look for the pious, Allah helps us. We don't want to be those who perpetuate indecency and do evil actions and are amongst the evil or the filthy and then we expect from Allah goodness. It's not possible. It's not our lot in life then. We have to trust in the promise of Allah and keep ourselves pure. And if we keep ourselves pure, then Allah has promised for us pure spouses and a pure future and goodness. Now, there are many detailed points about this conversation, including the fact that, for example, uh, it doesn't mean that there won't be trials and tribulations in life. No, because this is a place of testing to see if we are worthy of heaven. But... We have an obligation that stay away from evil. Don't, don't get caught up with people. Don't get caught up with situations in life that will take you away from your end goal of having goodness with Allah and a reward with Allah. And this is an important verse for us to remember, which is verse number 26 of Surah An-Nur. Again, briefly, well, there is one more verse that I wanted to take a look at today with you in Surah Al-Furqan. In Surah Al-Furqan, there are a few important discussions, including one that begins... In verse number 15 and 16. And it's related to the rest of our discussion for tonight about Surah Al-Qadr. 
When we take a look at, for example, Surah, uh, surah Furqan, the 25th Surah of the Qur'an, verse number 15, it says, Qul, أَذَلِكَ خَيْرٌ أَمْ جَنَّةُ الْخُلْدِ الَّتِي وُعِدَ الْمُتَّقُونَ كَانَتْ لَهُمْ جَزَاءً وَمَصِيرًا لَهُمْ فِيهَا مَا يَشَاءُونَ خَالِدِينَ كَانَ عَلَى رَبِّكَ وَعْدًا مَسْؤُولًا These two verses, when connected to the previous verses, for example, in verse number 11 and 12, uh, uh, 11, 12, and 13, and 14, it talks about the condition of the people of hell and what will happen to them and that they'll be in such difficulty that they'll pray for death from the punishment of hell. And Allah will say that there is no more death for you anymore, but if you want to pray for a million deaths and you still won't get them. And then after that, Allah says, is is that better for them or uh, is what is that better or is the everlasting paradise promised by promised to the God worry which will be the reward and destination is that better for them and then Allah gives a description in verse number 16 of heaven and the people of heaven <laughs> there they will have whatever they wish abiding in it forever a promise much besought binding on your Lord. This description of heaven is really important for us to have to look forward to. In here Allah is telling us, He says that heaven is that place which is an everlasting paradise. That it is a place that once you enter, you never leave. You're there forever. And in it, which is their reward and destination, Allah is promising. He's saying, لَهُمْ فِيهَا مَا يَشَاءُونَ In heaven you can have whatever you want. Everything will be allowed to you, anything that you, want, anything that you desire. And Allah concludes this verse by saying, كَانَ عَلَىٰ رَبِّكَ وَعْدًا مَسْؤُولَ And that this is a promise much besought or binding upon your Lord. Allah promises this. Allah doesn't break promises. So Allah tells us that heaven is a place that once you go into, you'll never come out of. And in it, you can have whatever you want. If you like cars, I'm sure there'll be Maseratis, Bugattis, Lamborghinis, Ferraris, Porsches, Tesla, Yani, who knows. <laughs> but the point is, is that Allah promises you anything and everything you want in heaven and it never ends, it never goes away. And that's where part of our conversation comes to in reflection of tonight, the night of Qadr. Tonight, after Maghrib, sets in the night of the 19th of the month of Ramadan. The night of the 19th, the night of the 21st, and the night of the 23rd are amongst the three nights that we believe to be Laylatul Qadr. And when Allah wants to explain to you what is Laylatul Qadr, He says, وَمَا أَدْرَاكَ مَا لَيْلَةُ الْقَدْرِ And what will make you understand what is Laylatul Qadr? Laylatul Qadr خَيْرٌ مِّنْ أَلْفِ شهر. That this one night is better than 1,000 months. What you can achieve in this one night, it may take you a th- it wouldn't you couldn't achieve it in 1,000 months. 1,000 months is over 80 years of life which tells us that this is a very significant and important night for us. When we say Qadr, it's traditionally translated to night of power, but it can also be translated according to Alama Tabai as the night of destiny, the night in which destinies are written. Because it's said that in the night of Qadr, Allah affixes the affairs for the entire year to come. That this whole year that's coming ahead of us, all of the good in it and all of the desires that you have in it should be asked for on the night of Qadr. Now, why, for example, is it in three nights and not, why don't we know the exact one night? There's some wisdom in this that the Ahlul Bayt explained that Allah chose to do it this way and chose to hide it so that you would approach Him three nights asking your desires openly and honestly. In another narration, it explains that it's given to us in three nights so that on the first night, you submit your request. On the second night, your request is reviewed. And on the final night, your request is sealed and put into effect. So we want to take advantage of all three of these nights and we want to worship on all three of these nights and we want to, as we worship Allah, we want to ask Him by the wasila of these nights of power and these special times that He has dictated for us to fulfill our needs in hajat. And part of those needs in hajat, while it's true, in this life I may want a Lamborghini, in this life I may want a giant mansion and house, in this life I may 
want for quarantine to end and life to go back to normal and for me to enjoy all the restaurants that I like. The more important hajat is not for this world that's temporary, but for the hereafter that's permanent. For the afterlife that will be forever to ensure that I ask for heaven. I ask for ease on the day of judgment. I ask for protection from the fire of hell. I ask for protection from the trials of the day of judgment. These are all things that I want to make sure that I ask for on these nights and I take advantage of these nights. These are the nights of spending in worship. And any action that we do in these nights will be magnified with reward. One of the first things that we want to do is after your iftar tonight, before 10 o'clock when we'll start the amal collectively online, you want to go take a ghusl. The ghusl on the nights of Qadr are important. They take the place of wuzu. But more importantly, as you perform these ghusl, our ulama have indicated, do this ghusl as if you are washing off your sins and asking Allah that, Oh Allah, by the barakat of this night, remove these sins from me and wash them off of me and wash them off of my soul and my body so that you never hold me to account for them and that you forgive them for me in this world. And then once we perform that ghusl, inshallah, at 10 o'clock after we've had some iftar, don't eat too heavy so that you can do some ibadat and worship, that you can spend some time worshiping Allah in these nights and asking for His mercy and asking for all of your needs that come for the coming year. Ask for your family, ask for your friends, ask for your relatives, ask for anybody and everybody who's in need. And more importantly, Ask for those mu'mineen who you may not even like. You see, one of Allah's great mercies is, is that He gives everybody, even those who don't listen to Him. And one of the things that Allah sees as a good quality in His mu'min is that His mu'min is one who prays for everybody, even those people that He doesn't like. And that's a sign of true faith, when I can look past my ego and my anger and hope goodness for everyone. And that's an important goal that we want to achieve. Along with the Knights of Qadr, the Knights of the 19th and the 21st, 20th and 21st, are nights of extreme sadness for us. I want on these nights, starting from tonight, to change your behavior and your mannerism for the next three days. These three days are days of extreme sadness for us. They're days of extreme loss from, for us. In the history of Islam, there has only been one Amir al Mu'minin, one commander of the faithful, one leader of all of the Mu'minin. And these are the days of his Shahadat. These are the days of sadness for us. I want that, for example, this is our, our spiritual father. Our Holy Prophet told us that Ali and I are the spiritual fathers of this Ummah. This is the death of our father, this is the Shahadat of our father that these should be days of sadness. Change your behavior in these three days. Commemorate these days the way you would commemorate the loss of a relative, of a loved one, of an elder, of a father. Make it different. If you want to have the wasila of Amir al-Mu'mineen, show that you have sorrow in his sadness. That these are days that are difficult for us to go through. These are days that are difficult for us to be separated from our master. And that after Maghrib of tonight, for the next three days, my food will be simple. My desires will be simple. My state will be that as if my father passed away and left me alone. This is the day of the orphanage of the Ahlul Bayt. That they had only Amir al-Mu'mineen left over them. And after the leaving of Amir al-Mu'mineen, there's no one there. There's only difficulty. There's only loss. These are days of sadness for Ali Muhammad, and they should be days of sadness for us. If you can, turn down the lights. Listen to these majalis in places of worship in your house. If you have a place of salat, sit in that place when you listen to the majlis of Amir al-Mu'mineen. Amir al-Mu'mineen used to love the worship of Allah and would spend his time in the worship of Allah. So if you want to remember Ali ibn Abi Talib, remember him in places where you remember Allah. Sit like an orphan sits on the ground away from the comforts and pleasures, away from every ease to acknowledge that our Father, when His hand was over us, we were comfortable in life, we were happy. And now these are the days that He is leaving us. These are the days of changing loneliness. Up until now, Ali ibn Abi Talib had been alone. 
after shahadat of Rasulullah and Sayyida Fatima, Amir al-Mu'mineen used to say for 30 years they left me alone. I lost my brother, I lost my my spouse, I lost all of my family that was close to me, that were my guides and my friends, and they left me alone in this world. For 30 years I was alone amongst the people. And for 30 years the people abused Amir al-Mu'mineen and they gave him difficulty. And after tonight and after these nights, we will be the ones who are alone and Amir al-Mu'mineen will be the one who has left us and left us alone. That these are difficult days and times for us. Amir al-Mu'mineen was the one whose loneliness was such that he, they used to say that Amir al-Mu'mineen would go out into the desert and go to a well, into a well and put his face into the well and release the burdens and the stresses of his heart into the well. When Kambar once caught him, he asked him, Oh, Amir al-Mu'mineen, what are you doing? He says, Oh, Kambar, my heart is heavy with secrets and with affairs and with problems and with the affairs of, that I have responsibility for. And there is no one left in this world for me to lighten my heart to. Rasulullah left me. Zahra left me. So I come out here into the desert alone. And I turn my face into the well. And I expunge these things from my heart that have nowhere else to go in the world. Amir al mumineen how lonely were you? And now you're leaving us. It said that tonight was a night of anxiety, was a night of anxiousness. That in this month, in this year, Amir al mumineen had been promised by Rasulullah that, Oh Ali, in this month your beard will be dyed red with your own blood. And every year Amir al mumineen waited for that promise of Rasulullah to come true. And this year when the anticipation increased that the time had come for Amir al mumineen to return and go back to his friend and his brother Rasulullah, he was anxious and he was preparing. They said in this night, he stayed at the house of Bibi Umm Kulthum, his daughter. And when his daughter prepared the iftar, she presented before him milk and bread, and some say fruit, some say salt. And she put many things in front of her father, wanting to please her father. Amir al-Mu'mineen replied, he said, O oh daughter, when have you found me to enjoy all of these bounties at once from Allah? Take away one of them and leave the other with me. Amir al-Mu'mineen opened his fast very simply with bread and then spent his night in worship. Umm Kulthum says, in this night, I saw my father do something I had never seen him do before. As he would worship, he would exit the house, look up at the stars in the sky and call out, this is it, hi here, hi here, this is the one, this is the time. And he would come back anxiously. Repeatedly in this night I saw my father perform this action. When I told my brothers in the night that I have seen father do these actions in the night, they wanted to come to the house and knew that something was wrong and that maybe our father would be taken from us in injustice. But Amir al mumineen turned them back from the house and sent them away. In this way he spent his night in anticipation. For him it was anxiousness that he was going to prepare to return to his brother Rasulullah. But for us it was anxiety that over us was the hand of our father. Over us was the hand of our protector. Over us was the hand of Waliullah. And after tonight, while Allah was preparing to leave us, we spent the night in anxiety. My father spent this night in anxiousness that soon I will return back to my Lord. Soon I will return back to my brother Rasulullah. Soon I will turn back to Zahra, the flower of heaven. <laughs> ندعوك باسمك العظيم الأعظم الأعز العجل الأكرم يا الله 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 يا محمود بهك محمد يا أعلى بهك علي يا فاطر السماوات بهك فاطمة يا محسن بحق الحسن يا قديم الأحسان بحق الحسين 
Oh Allah, accept this small ibadat from us. Oh Allah, by the right of the night of the 19th that is beginning, and by the right of the time of Maghrib in which dua is answered, Ya Allah, forgive our sins and cover our flaws. Ya Allah, accept our small ibadat from us. Oh Allah, entitle us to Jannah and forbid us from, from hell. O oh Allah, there are those amongst our community, our family, uh, the mu'mineen around the world who are sick, give them shifa. There are those who are in difficulty, remove their difficulties. Ya Allah, there are those who are in fear, remove their fears. O oh Allah, hasten the son of Amir al-Mu'mineen in Zahra, hasten sahib of zaman make us from his upright supporters, keep our children on the upright religion of Ali Muhammad, and entitle us to shifa of Abu Abdullah. For the sake of all of our marhumin, and all of those who are in need of shifa and dua, one time Surah Fatiha, three times Surah Ikhlas, and your loudest salawat. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad.